Hello and welcome to episode 203 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, Australia, that waterlocked upside down country, is somehow now beating North America in EV sales and taking off like a boomerang, I might add. You see what I did there, Brian? I worked in two of the three Australian stereotypes into one tease. Oh, what's the third one? Uh, it's something about kangaroos, I don't know. Mm. A town in France is putting a canopy of solar panels over their cemetery. Call me old fashioned, but I think the only thing that belongs over a cemetery is a cloud of evil spirits. Okay. Com companies are developing ways to make fake palm oil so we stop burning down the Amazon. They're also developing ways to burn down the Amazon without burning down the Amazon, but still giving that Amazon burning satisfaction. Nice. A pilot project in New York City is deploying window-mounted heat pumps in an effort to reduce carbon emissions. They're also safer as they drape down inside and outside the window, unlike older air conditioning units that could fall out of the window. I'm against that for comedy purposes alone, like that Seinfeld episode. this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also on this week's show, fire-resistant batteries for e-bikes are coming. I'm excited about that. Uh, Eva, EV batteries for winter are also coming out. I'm even more excited about that because, Brian, I predicted that a long time mm -hmm. ago. I can't believe they're actually talking about it already, actually. Uh, heat pumps on a dirty grid are still cleaner than burning gas. So we got a great show for you this week. Yeah, except I have a cold what? suddenly. It's starting to come on, yeah. Just starting to come so, Are you sure it's not COVID? Should we stop the I'm podcast now? Well, no. I am I guess I'm not 100% sure, but no. Just got a cold coming on, but I will persevere. Okay. You're a trooper. That's what you are. You are just a hardcore <laughs> trooper. Our audience relies on us every week. Some people cannot commute without us, and uh, yep. their lives would come to an end if you did not show up for work today. So thank you. Yeah, Thank me for my service. Uh, okay, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, we spoke about our friend Barry. I visited Barry when I was in Toronto. And Barry was telling me, and I shared this on the show, how he's got a farm north of Toronto, and the farm is heated and cooled with geothermal. And uh, I told you that, and you seemed quite confused about the whole thing. And uh, I remember it as if it was just a couple of weeks ago. So he's looking at doing that and maybe adding How some How do you get power. geothermal before you get solar panels? And <laughs> I have other questions. Why does a cinematographer have a farm? <laughs> answer my questions, please. I cannot answer that question. Wow. Okay, so we heard from Barry, and Barry is prepared to uh, answer your questions, James. I mean, you seem kind of accusatory about the whole thing. Uh, it seemed weird to me. It seemed weird to me. Like, I, it's not the way that I would go. I would have, if I was Barry, living in the lap of luxury, um, you know, a successful, world-renowned cinematographer, uh, I would have um, 15 maids, three butlers, just in case. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I would have uh, all the EVs that there are, all of them. Yeah. And then I would get geothermal. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, here's the explanation. So Barry wrote in to answer your questions, James, and this is what he says. Uh, we built our house and installed our geothermal system over 20 years ago. We discussed at great lengths with our architects about going off-grid, but they felt strongly that renewables weren't quite there. If building this house today, I'd definitely go off-grid. So that's the first answer. Okay, so was all geothermal, built. what he's saying is geothermal was way ahead of solar then. Uh, we had yeah. geothermal technology possible for the homes, even though it seems yeah. like, you know, you'd be hard pressed to get an installer who was experienced around here. You'd have to yeah. maybe travel a bit of distance. And this is for yeah. a, f a house that's on a farm that he built new, if he has architects, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. Interesting. Yeah. And so solar, of course, did exist back then 20 years ago, but, you know, that was really still the early days and you would have been a very early adopter. It would have been very expensive and you wouldn't get the efficiency. And batteries uh, too, because you would need batteries to go off grid. If you truly wanted to go off grid, you would need batteries. 
Yeah, they didn't so, exist uh, at all. I'm mean, aside from banks of lead acid, which you don't want, really. Yeah, I do. I think people had were doing that 20 years ago, like lead acid batteries from cars, but you know, obviously not the best. Uh, so anyway, he goes on to explain uh, further here. It looks like we're going to go with a large ground-mounted tracking solar system. Ooh, I just got a tingle in my groin. That's that's <laughs> interesting. I, the ground, yeah, ground-mounted tracking. Wow. Yeah. So See, he that's says what I would yesterday do when I was Barry, I would get tracking because I could. Well, there you go. So uh, hopefully answering this to your satisfaction, he says, yesterday I went and looked at one. Pretty incredible. It was on a Mennonite farm and they had six. They've always refused to have power supplied by a utility. Everything used to run off of diesel. Their panels feed into 20 10K batteries. Wild. They still have a standby generator just in case. So nearby there's Mennonite farms and this is what they're doing. Is So is, I think he means 20 or uh, 10, 20 kilowatt 10K, batteries? Uh, tw uh, pr probably 10 kilowatt hour batteries, I would say. Okay. Well, that's where for a Mennonite farm, there's usually, uh, I don't know how many people are on a Mennonite farm. Is it just Mennonites? Just, or is it a community? Yeah. I can't remember. It's a community of, you know, a self-sustaining kind of farm community, I would guess. Um, and he goes on to say, then I went to look at a new wind turbine. It produces 8K, which I guess is 8 kilowatts, and it's around 10 feet high, 5 feet wide. It's pretty impressive. My goal is to eventually add batteries when they're cheaper and go off the grid. He says they've always had a standby generator there on the farm. I would model what the batteries would do for you if it's that serious. If you're, And I, I also yeah. I have a bias against wind turbines for personal use because they require maintenance. Uh, they can yeah. break down and, uh, well, they can, I suppose, I don't know. Like if, uh, if he looked at it, that's one thing, but uh, they can cause noise. Um, I don't know. I, I like the, you know, the simplicity of solar and maybe a battery or two. I don't, uh, is he going to be connected to the grid? Yeah, he'll be connected to the grid and then so eventually be, maybe get some batteries and disconnect. That will probably be mean that he'll be selling the power to the grid then when it's in excess because there's always... I guess, which could be a benefit of just staying on the grid e even in the long term. Yeah, and I don't know exactly. He's in Ontario, so I don't know what their feed-in tariff is or what their rates are, but, you know, so you got to play with these things. you got to, you know, put them on a napkin and see what, what plays out for you. The installer should be able to do that. Yeah, and, and even adding batteries might even make sense at this stage, even at this price. But yeah, you'd have to run the numbers and figure it all yeah, out. That would be me. I would throw in a battery before a wind turbine. Um, unless he goes and picks up a, a Ford F-150 uh, EV and, and uses that as the battery. I mean, um, does he drive yeah. a larger vehicle because he is out in the country? Do you know? Uh yeah, he drove me around in a kind of an older SUV, so yeah, it was large. Yeah, well, maybe that's an option because uh, there is more and more vehicles now that will... I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about like, you know, I would take the money from the wind turbine and put it into a battery because I might profit from that. It might sort of pay for itself over time. Um, but then also you would have perhaps battery backup during outages. And I would think, I don't know if this is true, but out here... Uh, a lot of rural people have more power outages and longer power outages than we do, um, you know, in the city. And I, that's true for a lot of people. It may not be true for Barry, but um, that would be one thing to consider because there's, you know, if you go a day every year without power, it, it kind of starts to make uh, financial sense to you or at least uh, worth it. Yeah, no, rural properties, uh, I'm assuming uh, more power outages in most places. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. I'm actually really glad to go back to us because I did have those legitimate questions. <laughs> Why is he on a farm, though? Does he have goats? I mean, is oh, there chickens? Right. That's right. I forgot that part. He says uh, he has a farm because he's from Saskatchewan. <laughs> That's not an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Saskatchewan. I want a, uh, you know, a mansion on a cliff overlooking the ocean that's coming up. Well, I think, I mean, you've had a large backyard garden in the past. You're, sure. you're practically a farmer. Well, practically. <laughs> Does he have a lawn tractor? We should. These are questions we should. <laughs> I, I want know. answered. You know, Barry, write I, in again. Do you have a lawn we'll tractor? Or are you looking at an electric one? Because we talked about Brian's brother going electric. Because your brother lives on a rural property. And, yeah, that's uh, right. Invested in a electric lawn tractor, which I said last week. All these things are going to become 
price parity soon because the battery density and the cheapness of them and the power output for them is getting better and better. So we're getting, you know, within a couple of years or so, there won't be any excuse to buy a combustion roll-on tractor or a combustion snowblower. Does he have a snowblower? <laughs> because there's a lot of things you have to have in the country, Brian. A lot of things. Oh, it's true. Yeah. I mean, to, to take care of a rural property can be sometimes quite extensive yeah. what you need. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what else do you have for us this week? Anything going on in your life aside from your virus? Uh, no, I just a quick hot take on the Oscars. This was uh, uh, on last night and I didn't watch it. I never watch it. You're horrible. We did talk being. about You're bad human Oppenheimer being. a long time ago. So I just wanted to put in my quick hot take because... Um, uh, the big snub at the Oscars was that Greta Gerwig didn't get nominated as Best Director for directing Barbie, even though there was other nominations. And Christopher Nolan went on to win Best Director. I think Oppenheimer is a fine movie. It's okay. Um, but the degree of difficulty, I think, with Barbie was much higher. And I think that's why Greta Gerwig is a better director than Nolan. Whoa, because whoa, imagine... whoa, 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 whoa. You're good. Oh, <laughs> do not cancel our podcast, people. We just lost 10% of our audience. Come on. You can't badmouth Christopher Nolan. Uh, not, okay. not that you are, but, you, you know, uh, a lot of the young kids today really are Nolanites. They, yeah, they like their Nolans. It, it's true. Yeah, I don't know. He's all right. I think uh, his first film was his best one, and it's been all downhill from there. But um, <laughs> you are a curmudgeon, sir. You, yeah, you retired film professor, have nothing good to say about the Oscars or Hollywood in general. I mean, That's I right. loved every film that was nominated. I I had a uh, a, uh, a viewing marathon before the Oscars, and I watched. One day I watched five hours straight of films and then I conked out. I couldn't make it through. <laughs> but there's no way to watch a film as broken up, but I had to break it up. Um, but anyway, my point being is that I think Greta Gerwig is a better director because the degree of difficulty is higher. Imagine taking a toy and making a giant film for two giant corporations, Mattel and whatever movie studio paid for it. You got to make those studios, your corporate masters happy, and then somehow make a fun, entertaining movie based on a doll. That's super hard. Like, I think a lot of people could have made a decent movie about Oppenheimer, especially it's based on a very large, well-researched book. So you have a huge kind of starting point there. But the fact that Barbie was so fun and entertaining, I think, was quite remarkable. The, the fact that she pulled that off was amazing. I agree. And there's also, she wrote it. She co-wrote it with her husband, uh, who's a director and writer. And yeah, it is an achievement. I, I agree with that. Um, but uh, yeah, part of it, it walks, is the writing, part of it is the directing. And it walks an interesting line because, of course, it's a feminist film, but they still want to do it in a fun and entertaining way that doesn't alienate you know, uh, the, the male viewers, and I think it didn't, aside from the, the craziest of people. So, yeah, <laughs> she really threaded a, uh, threaded a needle there with that movie that I think was quite remarkable. I do, too. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a fun romp. And uh, quite, uh, I was really thrilled that uh, Oppenheimer and Barbie became a sort of a internet thing and people saw both yeah, of fun. them. And that's really good for getting people back to the theaters, which you and I are both... Um, in favor of because that's where we we developed our boyish dreams of making movies is in those theaters and that's where barry probably decided to become a cinematographer yeah uh, so yeah it's uh it's a good thing um oh i wanted to talk about one of the oscar nominated films uh poor things which was part of my marathon and started on friday night uh have you seen poor things no it was at the 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 the, the, the the film festival you went to was it not and you didn't watch it because you were yeah. too good for for emma too good for emma you were you had to watch well, more snooty films if if i can so it was directed by yorgos lanthimos and i'm not a huge fan of his either love him you're wrong on that this is like siskel and ebert this episode <laughs> you're wrong and you're you're i don't know who you are but you are uh, playing one of the more curmudgeon of the two and they're both curmudgeon um, I loved it. And there was a scene early on in the film. Uh, it's, it takes place sort of in a, um, you know, pre -ind early industrial times where this inventor, uh, it's not reality. It's set in a sort of a fanciful London, but it's not really, you know, specific because it is a, a bit of a fantasy film. 
But um, they had a scene where they went out into the world, this inventor who had a horribly scarred face, so he went out in his carriage, which he invented, and it seems to run off of steam or something. And it, it would predate cars, apparently, by a little bit. And when they had the first electric cars, or not electric, well, some of them were electric, but some of the, the first vehicles, motorized carriages, as they called them on the road, they would put these horse heads at the front so they wouldn't scare the horses because the road was full of horses. That's something yeah, we talked think, about on the show a few times. Yeah, that, that came up on the show. Yeah, a false horse head on your car. Well, they had one of them, and it was disturbing because the shot was the horse coming towards you, and you heard all the other horses, and then it right. curves, and it's a fake head, and it's this thing. <laughs> I was not surprised because of the show, because of how yeah. we talk about the transition between horses and cars, and now going from combustion cars to EVs, and what that transition is going to look like, and how fast it will be, uh, and the S-curve of things. So here's a clip from that. See, the clip does nothing. It's just not oh, going to mean a darn a thing to anybody, <laughs> but I thought I would play it anyway. Okay, that's good. On YouTube, I'll put a picture up for the YouTube viewers just to, to see. Okay. But anyway, I, I thought I would mention that. What did you think of the new Rivians? Rivian is a startup uh, EV maker in the States. They're kind of like the, the next in line Tesla because uh, they're only making EVs. They only intend to ever make EVs, and um, they've been around for a while. Uh, secret at first, and now they're out with a... Uh, I guess a medium-sized pickup truck and a SUV a version of that on the same platform. And now they're coming out with something smaller and something even smaller than that was, was a surprise. Yeah, so a smaller SUV at a lower price and then something that looks more like a hatchback or sort of like the Hyundai Ionic or, you know, Volkswagen Golf kind of shape. I thought they were both fantastic. It's it's going to take them a long time, unfortunately, to get them made and, you know, get mass production rolling. But, you know, these are larger volume vehicles at lower prices. So, you know, can't come soon enough. Yeah, the uh, the smaller one everyone's talking about, and I, I realized that they didn't put the orders out available. You can't order the smaller one because it's further off. It's like 2026, 20, 27, who knows. But uh, everyone would have ordered that because the RJ <laughs> yeah. at the... Uh, by the way, they had a really good launch event, which put Teslas to shame. They are what Tesla should be if they didn't have an awkward idiot who showed up an hour late and couldn't talk. Um, they had a really slick, nicely done presentation. It's nice to see somebody who's a, a sane person leading a company like this and very uh, congenial kind of guy and very open to, you know, talking to all the influencers in this area on interviews and taking the time to do that. So that's appreciated. And uh, yeah, everybody wants, he said everyone there in the office wanted the smaller one. We're, we're, it's kind of got a 70s vibe at the back, the way the sort of back is not like a, modern car it's like just sort of slouched down like a triangle kind of uh, angle at the back yeah but you always hear that americans in general don't go for that kind of a car that's really more of a european kind of thing a four-door hatchback is a european kind of but thing this thing's so, off-roadish this thing has some higher clearance yeah. and can go really fast like there's it's a, a kind, kind of a performance like a, version of it yeah, there was a Golf R that was kind of like that, the, a Golf that was sort of lifted kind of higher. So it's maybe, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, the SUVs are the most popular format in America. So I would assume that the SUV shape will sell more. Well, they've been struggling, Rivian, a little bit. And, uh, you know, everything's tentative. It was tentative when Tesla brought out the Model 3. They were, you know, in scary positions sometimes. So we'll see about that. Uh, a new report claims that BYD's new EV platform will slash costs even further. And this is even further than they said like a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago when we had it on the show. As the automaker kicks off a liberation battle, they're calling it, quote unquote, against gas power cars. My feeling on this is that Tesla is no longer the company that's pushing the EV transition. I think they're handing that off to BYD now. I think BYD will have the power of the communist government to subsidize them and uh, to allow them to dump things onto certain markets. But ultimately, like what happened with solar panels, this is probably going to be a good thing for the world, for the planet. Um, it's hard not to think that. But yeah, I think that they are, and you know, Tesla's they're not going to have a mass-produced smaller car for some time, probably. 
and um, their, I don't know, I say their CEO has, has tarnished the brand and maybe turned a few people off. It's hard to measure that, but it sure seems that way. But I will give him credit for one thing, Brian. Um, he stood by his convictions about advancing, you know, the primary objective of the company was to advance the electrification of transportation. And he's, I give him full credit for doing that. It's quite obvious and even more obvious now that we see how the incumbent automakers are stumbling and they're not making EVs competitively priced and they're not, you know, um, up to the standards of uh, Tesla in some ways, as far as the electrification game goes. But he is, you know, he's opened up the Tesla charging network and we're starting to see that unfold. And that's, a, you know, it's going to be a big thing. It's going to be a big piece of the puzzle for this transition and getting it going faster. Yeah, it's unfortunate the cheaper Tesla car is still a couple of years away. Um, yeah, BYD, it sounds like, is probably going to get there first. Uh, Tesla's probably more profitable. I don't know for sure what the details are on BYD. Tesla's probably still making more money per car, but... BYD has definitely got the volume, and they're now, yeah, surpassing Tesla in terms of volume, which is a big deal. And remember, they're a battery maker, BYD, and they have some of the best batteries, and they seem to be part of um, the Chinese companies that are announcing, you know, improvements, which we'll get to later in the show. Uh, okay, so a story here from Electrek. This is a town in France that is going to cover its cemetery with solar canopies. This is San Joaquin in France, and they're going to put up, it's just 1.3 megawatts of solar canopy, which isn't, isn't huge, but it's a community of 4,000 people. They're going to get You mean to say the they're taking the, the space of a, a graveyard and saying, okay, this is kind of wasted space because everyone's dead. Yeah. <laughs> so why not throw, this is quite remarkable. I am really blown away by this. Yeah, or, you know, maybe the, the gravestones could use a bit of shade. Maybe those, uh, sure. those people lying in the cemetery could use a little bit of shade. Uh, light still comes through, of course, with a solar canopy. Usually the panels aren't completely opaque. Um, and France has been very big on solar canopies in general. This is a thing that's, um, I believe, a law now in France. We talked yeah, about this on to, the show. You can't build a parking lot of a certain size without them. Without... Um, yeah, solar panels on a, a canopy. But there's another cool thing about this project. It's going to also uh, collect rainwater for a nearby sports complex, wow. which will also help prevent flooding in the marshy cemetery. So this community is built in the center of Briere Marsh. So they do have problems with water. And so excess water can be collected on these panels and then, uh, you know, s saved and used rather than, uh, you know, flooding the place, which is apparently built on a marsh. You think Barry has a graveyard on his farm? I mean, some, some <laughs> farms do. It's true. <laughs> but yeah, you, wow. That's, uh, I love it when you kill two birds with one stone when it comes to renewables. Yeah. Like when you, yeah. you take an idea and um, solve two problems with it. Like that's or three if you need the shade on this, the dead yeah. people. But, <laughs> but, but it's, it is kind of a feat because, of course, you know, cemeteries, that's a tricky place. You would have to get buy-in from the community that this would. is okay, and apparently the community is okay with but it. But the community's dead. I don't understand. Like, like <laughs> well, who are you okay. asking? I guess the greater community that's visiting the graveyard. Well, I see lots of flowers, so that some of these must be relatively recent deaths. And I'm not thinking it's like from 300 years ago and no one cares about that. Yeah, no, the, the picture in, included is just a rendering. This is not going to happen until um, summer 2025. So it hasn't happened yet, um, but it's in the works. God, renderings are getting good. Yeah, you were you thought that was a real picture. Well, yeah. I got my, my brightness turned down on my monitor so it doesn't affect my YouTube video. But uh, yeah, they're getting good. You just get a, a, a hey, make me a graveyard with solar panels over it. And Dolly will do that's that it. for you. That's all it takes. Well, that's interesting. I uh, yeah, looking at the the how they depicted it, the um, they're translucent. The um, the light comes right through the areas where there's not black parts. And yeah, that's those that's kind of the default on solar panels is that there's a solar collecting area, and then the rest is clear. You can get some of them that are opaque as well, that sort of black out that area depending on what you need. So my solar panel for my RV is 
you know, it's got a solid back to it, probably for protection, which I'm glad it does because you're hauling it around, putting it in the car and and uh, carrying it with you and setting it up places. Yeah, and my, my friend Kim out in the, the Lumsden Valley there, she got black panels on her roof just because it looked better. Like it, I really it, like that, yeah. Know, I wish I... Yeah, it was a really nice look. They're very much visible facing the street, and she realized, oh, will this look better if I get a panel that's all black? And so that's what I she did. I think, her, I, if I remember, her roof is black too, so either way, Could it be, looks yeah. better. Yeah, it looks a lot Blends better. Blends in nicely, yep. Yeah, I asked about that, and they had to. They said it would be more, and they were discouraging me because I was already being a cheap ass about it. I had a budget, and we were stretching it as far as we could. And believe me, <laughs> yeah, it was stretched. Well, that's very interesting. I look forward to that. Uh, the Australian plug-in vehicle sales, that is, you know, plug-in hybrids, uh, which work um, for a little while as an EV and then become a hybrid after that using gasoline. And, you know, I'm trying to, to strike a balance with the experts who listen to our show and the noobs who are don't know what we're talking about. I don't want to, you know, talk over them. I want to be able to explain things as we go. So I hope that the experts who are listening, our longtime listeners, will put up with that. But, yeah, so those, uh, when they say plug-in vehicles, it means uh, plug-in hybrids and EVs. And that's a good thing because those plug-in hybrids often don't burn gas unless they're you know, used exclusively for long trips. So it's 10%. And uh, I think it's only 7% in North America or something like that, 7 or 8%. Um, anyway, Australia was known for not having any EVs when, you know, Tesla was rolling out its S and X. And uh, Europe had a few cars of its own. The Renault uh, brand had one and the Nissan Leaf. And Australia wasn't getting many of those and they weren't getting the Teslas and they were, you know, there was a lot of people like us who were itching to have one who were waiting all their lives to have one and they couldn't get it. Well, now they just surpassed us. And the reason why is because China, Chinese models are available readily there. And I don't know, this says something. Uh, it says something that if you build it, it will come. Like, you know, the yeah. Chinese aren't looking at entering the North American market very broadly yet, but um, the fact that you have those there, the fact that they're priced competitively, they're fairly, you know, well-priced. There's not, uh, I don't think there's uh, the tariff that some other places have, like North America and Europe is 25%. I don't think it's quite that high. Correct me if I'm wrong. Write me, cleanenergyshow@gmail.com if you're in Australia. I know we have a few people down there listening. Um, yeah, but I, I just think that it says something, that, you know, the fact that they're available, well, they'll be bought. Yeah, they, they don't have the large auto industry that there exists in North America, so they're not as anxious, the government's not as anxious about protecting that. But yeah, a couple of months ago, we talked about New Zealand, and we had the list of the top 10 selling EVs in New Zealand, which right next to Australia, so very similar, and... Yeah, three or four of them on the list were the, the Chinese uh, EVs, which I thought was interesting. And yeah, we just don't have access to those here yet. So the, the list looked quite different than what we have here in North America. Uh, okay, so a story here from The Independent about uh, heat pumps in apartments in New York City. So we did talk a week or two ago about... Uh, portable heat pumps becoming a thing. And these are units that you can put in your apartment. So if you don't own a house, it can be difficult to, you know, change your heating system. But there's now heat pumps that can fit in windows. And New York City, um, this is the New York City Housing Authority, is doing a pilot project now where they're putting in uh, heat pumps in windows in apartments in New York City. And as I referenced off the top of the show, they look a bit, little bit different um, like a window unit air conditioner is just a big box that sits in your window, and we're all kind of familiar with those. Um, but they've been kind of on the way out for many years, so no one really thought about redesigning those. Um, but now, with this new opportunity to turn them into heat pumps, there's suddenly now new excitement, new market possibilities for window-mounted you know, heat pumps and or air conditioners. So the design is a lot better. And I, you know, we have talked about this, I think, before on the show, but it doesn't sit in the window like a box. It drapes over the window. So part of it hangs on the outside, and then part of it hangs on the inside. So it doesn't block most of the window. 
Um, and it's way safer. Like those big boxes in a window, if you're not careful, yeah. whoosh, can go yeah. uh, out the window. Mine was pretty precarious and, uh, at my old house, but there was nothing under it <laughs> except for the odd gopher or a yeah. squirrel or something. But yeah, in New York City, yeah. you could crush people walking down the street. No, and we've all seen pictures, I think, of New York City apartment buildings that might have, you know, dozens or even hundreds of those uh, air conditioning units. So um, this is uh, specifically an article about a uh, one particular person who now has one of these uh, heat pumps and uh, it, it's a pilot project. And if this works, um, you know, if everyone seems to like it, they're going to roll these out in a, a much broader way. So um, I've also lived in apartments with old style radiators for heating. And like it mentions in the article here, these are often super inefficient. Um, for many reasons that, you know, the system itself can be inefficient, but uh, can be difficult to control the heat on these. So what often happens is it gets too hot in your apartment in the wintertime and you end up opening the windows um, to cool down. And that's something I have definitely done with uh, a couple of apartments that I lived in in Toronto. So this is a very inefficient way of heating these buildings, which can be perhaps, um, you know, fixed by these window mounted uh, heat pumps. Well, that's interesting then, because um, you you buy one, it heats, it cools, it maybe supplements your heat. I don't know, you know? Yeah, um, and they're going to try and do 4,000 of these heat pumps over the next two years if uh, everything goes well in this pilot project in uh, New York City. Okay. And on a related story from, this is from Canary Media. So, um, I have often wondered about this, and we probably discussed it when I put in my own heat pump. So I have an air source heat pump now heating my home instead of a gas furnace. And we have a fairly dirty grid where we live. There's a lot of coal power on the grid. So I did kind of wonder, you know, am I going to be saving any carbon emissions by going to an electric air source heat pump as opposed to burning natural gas in my furnace. And at the time, the best calculation I could come to was that it was probably at least a wash. Maybe it was slightly better, but at the very least, my carbon emissions would probably be about the same, hopefully a little better. So uh, this is a story here from Canary Media. Yes, heat pumps slash emissions, even if powered by a dirty grid. So this is a study in the US, it's not Canada, but I think you can extrapolate fairly well. Um, so um, it says here the latest study, so this is from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They modeled the entire US housing stock and found that over the appliances expected lifetime of 16 years, this is for an air source heat pump, switching is better in terms of carbon emissions in all of the 48 uh, contiguous states in the United States. Um, and that includes the absolute worst of those. There are some uh, states that have um, an enormous amount of uh, coal power on the grid. And even for those, it is an improvement to go with an electric air source heat pump. How dirty does the grid have to be, Brian? How dirty does it have to be? Yeah. Because ours is dirty. Yeah. Ours is like 30 or 40% coal, I think. Um, there's U.S. states that are worse than that. Yeah, there are, because they have the coal, a lot of coal right there, and they don't care. Well, we don't care either, obviously. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so you, yeah, switching to, if everybody switched to... Heat pumps in the U.S. right now, it would immediately shrink the carbon emissions 5 to 9% without the grid changing. And the study takes into account the fact that the grid is getting cleaner. They know the grid is clean, getting cleaner over time. So that's included in these calculations. But doing it right now, if everyone in the U.S. got rid of their you know, fossil furnaces and switched to a heat pump, already saving 5 to 9% of emissions. Wow. Okay, so it's better, but it's expensive, and there needs to be subsidies for for people to really make it worth their while. Yeah, and there can be, and, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act does provide some incentives, so look into those where you are, and they do vary by, by state. And if you're new to the show, Brian and I live in a very cold place, especially in the wintertime, and his heat pump is only certified to part of the way 
down the line on the thermometer that yeah, our temperature so goes. Then in the 22 Celsius, beyond that, it's back up resistive heat. But, you know, I assume this study took all of that into account. So even in the coldest states with the dirtiest grid, yeah. still better to go to a heat pump. Interesting. So have you any update on your heat pump? Because last week you said you were struggling with it. Still got some more data from it, and they're sending the data off to the manufacturer. They're they're trying to figure out something. Okay. Well, still, still an early adopter you are, uh, a pioneer, as it were. Yeah. So they want to make palm oil in a lab. There are several companies working on this. This is uh, this is similar to some of the things we've talked about on the show uh, with precision fermentation. This is how they're doing it. Uh, they're using the fermentation process that you might find in a brewery and replicating things. However, it's still more expensive than palm oil, so we're not going to see this replacing or disrupting palm oil um, too soon. Yeah, but palm oil, it's always been one of those things that you hear is quite kind of energy intensive to, yeah. to cultivate, right? Yeah, and they, they tend to chop down and burn down the Amazon to make more room, f you know, for planting palm trees. Uh, or palm oil is like, because it's such a, a huge, well, it's a big problem for the environment because, and it's not healthy either. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know why they can't come up with something better than palm oil because palm oil is not terribly healthy. But yeah, they there's many areas in the world where they're doing horrible things uh, to make sure that they can make palm oil because there's such a an appetite for it. It's in your snacks. It's in your soap even for some reason. Uh, it's in pretty much everything. But palm oil plantations have caused vast deforestation. Um, I think the reason is because the palm trees don't offer much of a carbon sink compared to what the trees that were there before. Right. And a handful of startups are trying to reinvent one of the most environmentally destructive ingredients in our diets, palm oil. This is the New York Times. Uh, endless miles of rainforest worldwide have been flattened and burned and turned into palm oil plantations. Companies are making palm oil by precision fermentation. Now, there's several companies working on this, and it isn't approved for food yet. But it's starting to show up in things like cosmetics, where the company-to-company uh, -company sales are worthwhile. And you can say, well, this is palm-free, palm oil-free, and you can feel a little less guilty about your cosmetics purchase. Uh, while making a substitute in a lab may be less labor-intensive than raising forests and nurturing millions of trees, they write, to complete, compete on a price and volume basis, the startups will need to access... Uh, huge manufacturing facilities, and they're going to need lots of investment for this to happen. Um, they're going to, the big, you know, it's just same old story. The bigger, the better for bringing down that price. So you can't do it in a brewery, you know, um, a local brewery sized vat. You need the biggest vats there are, and you need a lot of them, and you need to do this um, on a massive scale for the price to come down. For now, the startup said the products they're selling are still more expensive, but, you know, something to keep an eye on, and it's kind of uh, encouraging. I didn't see that coming, you know, uh, because that's one of the problems that, uh, you know, precision fermentation can solve, apparently, just like it solves uh, agriculture, because agriculture is, uh, you know, it's a vast amount of water and energy that goes into one liter of milk, so. Yeah, so being able to create the proteins from milk in a lab is uh, going to be a lot more uh, efficient. So yeah, I guess crops that are kind of expensive per liter are going to be maybe the first ones for this kind of thing. And, and palm oil, it probably, you know, earns a pretty penny. So uh, good to hear that someone's working on that. Uh, okay, a story from Electrek. Um, we've talked before about battery fires. It's not a particularly common thing, but it does happen with electric cars and with electric bikes. And Whenever a bike battery catches on fire, it makes huge, huge headlines. There was a few such fires uh, in New York City here, but and this article have died, from Brian, people have died in New York City from these fires, and the reason is because they're cheap, um, un sort of unregulated Chinese batteries that they've bought from Alibaba or somewhere like that directly from China. They're not regulated, and another problem is you have to take the charger off them. Uh, I just wanted to point that out because if you leave them charging, it tells you to stop charging them after a few hours. If you leave them charging, bad things can happen. So it's kind of scary. I'm a little concerned about my e-bike battery that way. You have to sort of set a timer or something to remind yourself. Yeah, yeah. Just in case. No, it is, a, it is a serious issue, but it is one of those things where it tends to get more publicity 
than maybe it should here. The article says that you're around five times more likely to die on the subway in New York City I believe than it. you are from a bicycle you fire. You could die from getting peed on, from the disease that follows. I don't know. That's right. So uh, Rad Power Bikes, which is one of the U.S.'s largest uh, e-bike manufacturers, uh, they're working on this problem, and they are basically in... It's called potted, potted cells. And the cells themselves, the battery cells, there's several in a battery pack. They're now encased in resin. And this resin helps to uh, insulate them from water. It's often water that gets into the batteries over time. And this can cause the kind of shorting and corrosion that leads to a fire. But by encasing them in this resin, they make a much better seal and if one of the batteries does catch on fire, it's far less likely to spread to the other cells in the battery pack. So, um, you know, this is something that is probably eventually going to become commonplace. Uh, another company, Luna Cycle, has done this as well. But Rad Power is probably the largest uh, e-bike manufacturer to go down this road. And uh, they're just starting to do this. Well, if you look at what is in an e-bike battery, there are a series of cells, right? They look like... I don't know, uh, like elongated C cells, let's say, for our battery flashlight, um, you know, flashlight batteries. And if one of them gets overheated, uh, it causes a chain reaction. It just takes one cell to overheat. Now, here's what I would do if I was living in New York City and I had an e-bike and the battery was questionable right now. I would charge it on my stove. If you had one of those hoods that go over your stove, if the flames okay, went yeah. up into that hood, okay. you'd probably be okay. If you put it yeah. on the couch, it's going to start your couch on fire <laughs> if it if it did go on fire. Now, yeah, I'm not saying it'll go on fire, but you wonder about it. And we, we've got it, so yeah. many batteries. I've got, you know, a snowblower battery. I've got uh, lawn batteries. So many batteries these days for so many different things that I, I kind of worry about them. Um, and also, I'm you know, I'm apt to, to buy cheap ones off of Amazon when they need replacing. So No, and when I was flying recently, they, they as part of the safety speech now on airplanes, they tell you if your phone gets lost in the cushions of your seat to, you know, call over a flight attendant to retrieve it because of the risk of fire. And, of course, what happened several years ago was a couple of phone batteries caught on fire on airplanes, and they had to kind of remake the whole kind of safety system for um, batteries. I mean, I don't think it's really a huge problem anymore. There was one particular phone that was prone to fires. Yeah, it was a Samsung, I think. Yeah. And that was a bit, that was like the, you know, a big shakeup. It had a reputation for a while, but then it went away quickly because everybody has phones and you got to have a phone, right? Yeah. Not the but case they with still EVs. have an one, announcement now. One EV on goes on fire. Yep. Be careful if you lose your phone in the seat cushions. Get someone to help you right away because it's a fire risk. Interesting stuff. All right. So SK On, uh, that's uh, one of the big battery manufacturers in China. Um, yeah, they, they're talking, they're making announcements. These guys, they supply the batteries for Ford, Volkswagen, Hyundai, and others. And they are trying to tackle the problem of, uh, you know, we have winter problems. This is a problem we have where we live because it can get down to minus 40, get down to minus 36 once this year where we are. Uh, very, very nasty cold snap because it was windy for three days or something like that. It was just one of the worst cold snaps we've had in many years for that reason. And a lot of cars weren't working, including a few EVs, but it was always comes down to the 12-volt battery. You know, it's always a 12-volt battery in, in cars, whether it's combustion or EV, but usually there's less of a demand for um, the EV 12-volt to get it going because you're just turning on a computer. You're not cranking anything. Uh, however, you know, it is a problem. So I found that on our Chevy Bolt, which we bought only months ago, had maybe 50% range in that really cold weather. And yeah. Didn't make a difference to us as long as we plugged it in every night. And you got to plug it in because it heats the battery and it keeps it, you know, in a good shape for yeah. doing that. And you weren't going on any road trips. Yeah. You just had to get around to it. But if we were going on a road trip, it'd be a problem. Or if we were an Uber, an Uber driver or uh, somebody driving for the gig economy, that would be an issue. Um, but even though my wife uses it for work, she really doesn't put on a lot of miles on it. She, you know, she's a social worker. She makes two or three trips. It's a s small city we live in. And it's not an issue at all. And it's never, not, not even come close to an issue. Like it's, you know, we use maybe half of the half, a quarter of what 
the whole battery would be in the summertime and it's not an issue, but uh, it freaks people out and people, you know, you'll see them arguing on forums that, well, they don't work in winter because they lose half their range. Well, they work perfectly well. They just lose part of their range. Um, these guys say they, they lose up to 70%. I've never seen that. I've never seen more than 52% range loss yeah. from talking to other people. And we live in a very cold place. Yeah, about and, 50% is the most I've had. And we, we talk about this when it's in that very cold temperatures, right? We don't talk about it when it's just a little bit uh, below. But um, I guess EVs with LFP batteries typically lose uh, 50 or more percent of their battery range when temperatures drop as low as minus 20. Now, part of that you're using your battery to heat the cabin. You don't have waste heat from friction that you get in a combustion gas yeah. or diesel car. So you have yeah, to... and if you're driving down the highway, uh, the, the car cools down, you know, yeah. more quickly. You need more heat to keep it warm in the cabin. So, yeah, and, you know, um, discharging and charging the battery quickly heats it up as well, but that doesn't seem to do much on the highway for you. It maybe helps a little bit. Uh, the new batteries that they're talking about is extending the charging capacity by 16%. So they're going to charge faster and they're going to enhance the energy density by 19%. And they're calling them the Winter Pro battery, which sounds like a tire to me. But I, yeah. I, I've often thought about this. You know, Canada, we're not Norway. We're not even Alaska because most of Alaska, most of Norway is tempered by ocean. Uh, we're in the middle of the continent here and we get really cold. And they don't get that cold in most places of those. I mean, no, most populated places of those regions. You know, we get even colder here where there's only a smattering of people way up north in the Arctic, but there's not that many people up there. So, I mean, you're not going to make a car designed for the prairies of Canada, which have a few million people in them. We're not, a, you know, that large part of the market. But I thought that once EVs became ubiquitous, that we would maybe get specially formulated batteries for our problem, because you're not going to have this in Vancouver, Canada, where it's temperate and warm on the ocean. Now, Ontario usually doesn't get below, I mean, would you say it got below minus 15 very often even? Not in Toronto, northern, you know, north of Toronto, it can get to minus 20, 25, even probably minus 30, but yeah. Where Barry lives, Barry's north of Toronto, probably gets a little yeah, cold in there. But, you know, he's also near the Great Lakes, which, you know, ah, temper, you that's know, right. He is. Yeah. OK. Yeah. That helps, you know, temper. They're things. like an ocean, really. They're so big. They're so big. Um, yeah. So this is uh, this is an upgrade for their uh, SF battery, they call it. It's first introduced in EVs in 2021. And it is the ones that are able to reach an 80 percent charge in 18 minutes. So that's your high end day. With the 800 volt architecture, that's doing it in 18 minutes, which is great, and I think enough, because you're only well if you're only if you're living in an apartment. Okay, you got to wait 18 minutes, but you can run into a grocery store. You can um, do an errand near the charger, hopefully. But if you're on the road, I mean, by the time you go pee and get a coffee, well, that 18 minutes is is really mostly used up, and it's not much of an inconvenience, I find. Um, so that would be fast, but they're going to increase that to 15 minutes and beyond. So they're talking about, they're talking about, uh, a nine minute charges, basically having the time if they're already fast batteries charging and, uh, also having that winter formulation. So yeah, they say they they got together and they said they, there should be a jump in battery technology for the expansion of EVs. This is Samsung. And we are trying to lead in new technologies, and they are targeting a nine-minute battery charge by 2026, which is only, it's hard to believe, two years from wow. now. Yeah. Or six years into our podcast. And a 20-year lifespan by 2029. That's not as much of a problem because I think Tesla batteries tend to last that long anyway. They do at least in, in uh, they haven't been around for 20 years mostly, but they... Yeah. The batteries will do 20 years of mileage because of those people who use them for high mileage tend to last a long time. Yeah, uh, the longevity tests so far on the Teslas have been very good. But as we've said many times before, when a battery lasts longer than it did before, the price of it, when you're talking about the price per kilowatt hour, the amount of energy it outputs for the price that you pay for it, uh, goes down, you know, because you don't have to replace it for you know, a few years longer. So that's important for grid storage, which is important for decarbonizing the planet. Okay.
It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Consumer Reports surveys 270,000 retail locations controlled by 75 major retail and fast food chains. Brands like Costco, Ikea, Walmart, and Target. Only 1% of them offered EV charging. This is different than Europe. Brian, we need to get going on this. Ikea was better, of course. But... Um, these other chains, they're not getting on board, and I don't know why. Because it, it's it's a, it's a in a level two charger that charges your car, you know, in a few hours, can give somebody who comes there some juice, and they can you know kill a bird with a stone, or uh, they can charge. Maybe you can have a low cost DC fast charger of like say fifty kilowatts, and somebody can come to Walmart and maybe live, live in an apartment. And they can get the juice for the next few days um, if they can't charge at home. So it's important that they yeah. do this. I know Walmart did have an announcement. They are working on this as they refurbish their stores. But, yeah, you might even encourage your customers to spend longer shopping in the store because of this. It's exactly. maybe not a super fast charger. And they might want to stay there for a couple of hours. And the longer they stay, the more money they're going to spend exactly. in your business. My car needs a few more uh, electrons. I'm going to browse the housewares. The oil industry has fought against government support for clean technologies for more than half a century, the Guardian has revealed, even as vast subsidies have propped up its polluting business model. So basically what they're saying here, this, this look that they did, says that um, the fossil fuel companies have fought subsidies for the competition and enjoyed vast amounts. It, of uh, subsidies for itself, and it still continues to, by the way, in all parts of the world. It's grotesque. It lobbied lawmakers to block support for low-carbon technologies such as solar panels, electric cars, and heat pumps as far back as the 1960s, analysis shows. Time for a CS Fast Fact. Europe will be three degrees hotter Celsius, even if the world succeeds in limiting global warming to just 1.5. So we talk about how... The more north you go, the bigger the effect of global warming, the bigger the difference in temperature, average temperature. And Canada certainly uh, are north, looking at six degrees warmer than normal, and Europe is going to be three. And, you know, we've seen some heat waves there. They don't like it. It's not going to be fun. Yeah. No, that's not great. If 1.5 is the average, that means uh, some places will be more and some places will be less. Full of electric vehicle sales in France grew 37% in January 2024 compared to January of last year. The total EV market share rose to 25%. France, you're doing okay. Uh, EV drivers pay more in taxes and fees than ICE drivers, that is internal combustion engine drivers, in 36 states. That's unbelievable. That's from inside EVs. Between registration fees targeted at EV buyers and taxes levied against charging stations, the firm found EV owners in a majority of U.S. states could very well end up forking over more to the government annually than drivers of internal combustion engines. I don't know what to say. Yeah, the, the taxes on fuel have never actually been that high. Um and this is part of the reason. But right-wing governments will claim they are and that the government is screwing you, but they're not. They're, um, you're not even paying close to what the tax should be considering the damage that those fossil fuels are doing and the costs from storms and whatnot. Uh, solar accounted for 17.4% of Brazil's energy mix last week. Brazil, doing pretty good. Uh, PV Systems... Get this, up to 75 kilowatts, which isn't very big, uh, represent around 50% of the total capacity. Did Barry say what size of uh, solar system you were getting? No? No. So you have one that's about... Mine's about 8.7 kilowatts. And that's fairly substantial for a house or a good size one for a house. So I think this probably means some businesses and rooftop homes are accounting for 50% of the solar capacity. And of that, 17.4% of Brazil's electricity mix were met by that last week, which is pretty cool. It's, again, another indication that rooftop can play a significant part of the grid. And it's decentralized, so you don't have to rely on, you know, transmission lines and things like that because it's spread out. Uh, Australia, their nuclear facility that they have down there, this is not for nuclear power, but for um, sending... Um, 
what is it, photons or atoms or particles, the particle accelerator, uh, they're going to save $2 million over a five-year period by plastering the roof of their facility, which is round, with solar panels, a lot of solar panels. That's the NASTO campus, the ANSTO campus in Clayton. It is uh, hosting the synchrotron, where electrons are accelerated to almost the speed of light to allow researchers to investigate materials down to atom size. The facility is now host to 1.5 megawatts of rooftop solar, which is pretty yeah, darn good. Yeah, we have a synchrotron here in Saskatchewan, and they should probably put some uh, solar panels up to power because I imagine these things take a lot of energy. We should put solar panels on everything. By the way, this podcast brought to you by solar. Brian and I both have rooftop solar. We're not burning any grid right now. I'd like to think. Yeah, and the snow is starting to melt, and it's sunny out, so we should be good on my end. Good. Um, yeah, it's back. It's ba really uh, getting some good results. March is a good month um, for solar because it's cool and sunny often. All right, the facility, uh, like I said, round, plastered with solar panels. We should do that more often. Aiming for a sustainable Olympics, organizers of the Paris Summer Olympics have uh, kept new construction to a minimum. I like that. And prioritized building with wood. This is a story that was on Bloomberg. So their wood is sustainable because it grows back and sucks carbon in when it does. Um, yeah, I, I hate it when they when they go and they build 16 stadiums like Brazil did and then they don't use them. Yeah. And it's just a giant waste. The Olympics are a no, huge There have been a lot of facilities over the years that don't get used after the Olympics. And it's a real shame. 42 wind and solar projects totaling $11.1 billion in investment may be at risk by new rules, depending. This is Alberta. You remember we were talking last week about how they restricted uh, renewables and in, in most of Alberta, the good parts are yeah. not even usable because they have pristine viewscapes that, you know, oil's okay to screw up, but not renewables. Well, it's eleven point one billion dollars. This is a province of a few billion, a few million people. It's not a huge economy. It's big, but it's that's a lot of money. That's a lot of investment that's at risk. They don't give a shit about because yeah, it's weird. Because it's it's not their energy. It's the new energy, and they're threatened by it. And you know, wow, it's just really some of the stupidest things we've ever seen in Canada. Uh, Ukraine pounded targets in Russia on Tuesday with dozens of drones and rockets in an attack that inflicted serious damage on a major oil refinery and sought to pierce the land borders of the world's biggest nuclear power with armed proxies. That's from Reuters. Uh, you know, Russia, 40% of their GDP is oil. It's a large part of it. And they don't have a huge That's GDP. A lot. They don't have a huge GDP yeah. for, you know, the, the size of country they are. And they're still... Managing to sell oil, they haven't slowed down that much. So, I don't know. I get a small bit of, <laughs> I don't like war, but I get a small bit of pleasure when I see that uh, those bastards are losing some of their oil to, after they invaded another country. China's EV sales uh, and fuel cell heavy trucks. The sales of EVs and fu heavy fuel cell trucks, and like commercial vans. Uh, that's the category, light commercial, which is mostly vans, delivery vans. Well, all that's hit a record level at the end of 2023. And get this, is 10% or EVs now of heavy trucks sold or EV or fuel cells. Wow. Uh, and EVs will be 40% of China's uh, 2024 auto sales. So this is, you know, the auto sales in general, the cars that you and I drive, uh, taxi drivers and people like that are at 40% this year. We think they're going to hit 40%, but 10% already, and that's more <laughs> that's more than we have with cars in Canada and the United States, uh, are EVs. And these are the heavy ones. These are all the, the different trucks of a heavy, a light commercial, and otherwise. So that's impressive. And finally this week, this is from NPR, a methane tracking satellite has been launched by SpaceX. It's called Methane Sat. Not very inventive in the name, Brian, but they get to the <laughs> point. Uh, it's designed to detect methane gas. And that's a gas that is, uh, in the short term, packs an even bigger planet-warming punch than carbon dioxide. It does fade away after 
a certain amount of time quicker than the carbon does, but it packs a bigger punch for now, and now is what we're concerned about, especially because uh, the planet uh, is going to be damaged and changed. So this is led by the Environmental Defense Fund. This is not a government organization. This is people who have said enough is enough. They've got together their funds, and they've launched their own satellite, and it's going to have a target that's focused to just spot methane from the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry says, no, 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 we've got our own satellite. We're doing the tracking. You don't need to do this. BS. You can't be trusted. You're evil. Screw you. Uh, so they they know that, and they put up their own satellite, and they're going to shame them. Whenever they, you know, the data is going to be publicly available, and they're going to shame everybody that is putting out methane gas. Even me, if I have a Mexican and I'm in my pool making bubbles in the summer, they'll know because that satellite's going to fly overhead. So sometimes oil companies deliberately burn methane gas that they can't pipe somewhere. So that's nice. And we know that uh, all kinds of studies are coming out that show that the uh, oil industry is underreporting and there's a lot more methane from their um, natural gas operations leaking out or being burned on purpose because it's cheaper for them to do so. So recent projects has helped give a clear picture, but the data hasn't always been public or precise. And now it will be, especially from oil fields. The goal of the methane sat is to have a granular picture of where exactly methane comes from in the oil and gas operations around the globe, especially places like Texas, Russia, and Nigeria. It will provide data that will be free to the public that will allow governments, researchers, and others to have an unbiased view as opposed to the bias view from the oil industry from space of most oil and gas operations, almost all of them. And again, the data will be free to all interested and gas companies will be shamed into action, hopefully. Uh, methane from LNG operations can have a worse shorter term impact, as we've said, than CO2. So that's a good news story, Brian. Yeah, that's a nice thing to end on. So that is our show for this week. Please take the time to contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And on social media, we are Clean Energy Pod. Yeah, sit down and write us now, cleanenergyshow.gmail.com. And just a reminder that our videos of our show are on YouTube and TikTok, including special content that's not featured there. And as always, we'd like to mention that we do have a Clean Energy Show, uh, show store in our show notes. It's linked there. And uh, you can also donate to the show, as some people do. I continue to get emails from people who have either died or just something's happened that their regular payments are not going through. And now my yeah. inbox is getting flooded by that. So I say to you, if you're not dead, um, and if you are dead, you know, put a solar canopy over your grave. That's yes. something you should do. Maybe put that in your will. If you're new to the show, remember, subscribe on your favorite podcast app because Brian and I are here even when he's sick every week. We'll see you next week. 